So thank you to Carol for taking my spot. But I can I can tell you the legislature is running well today. They're they're uh, getting bills through, and that's where I was this morning. And they ha they're all bright eyed and bushy tailed at the Capitol this morning. Um, my name is Brenda Little. I'm the chair of the Laramie County Board of Tra Laramie County Community College Board of Trustees. So on behalf of the trustees, welcome this morning. We also have the Ag Business class, is that right? Ag Business class in, in the audience today. They are learning about public hearings this morning, which I think is, is very wise of their instructor to ask them to come. Welcome to our interview with Miles LaRoe for the position of interim president. Hi, Miles. Good morning. Um, Wyoming law states that the community college board shall appoint a chief administrative officer of the community college. And this board of trustees takes that responsibility very seriously and very solemnly. And we want to find the best interim president for students, faculty, staff, and the community. And in order to do that, we are inviting public input in the process. So we have invited the public and members of the college to be here for interviews and also public forums because we want to hear your comments on the candidates for the position of, of a president of this college. This interview is scheduled to last one hour. During that hour, we'd like you to listen to Mr. LaRose's responses and score them according to a score sheet you should have received. It is, is it green, blue, blue, thank you, Archie. If you have the score sheet from Tuesday, please use that one again today. And then when we are all done with, with interviews today, you can turn that score sheet into any board member, which would be me, John, Ed, Carol, Kevin. I think that's all, but Greg, who is, but Greg, but he, he's leaving. <laughs> so you can try to find him, but probably won't. Uh, we have another board member who is at the legislature today and, and not able to be with us. We are going to look at those score sheets, any comments on the score sheets, because we are inviting you to comment on those as well. We will look at your scores. We will look at your comments. You can put your name on them or not, depending on uh, what you want to do. We will use your comments and scoring in our analysis of, of our own scoring and comments of, of the interview committee. And then on February 2nd, we as a board are going to get together in executive session after our study session. And we will look at the, the scores, we will look at comments. And during executive session on February 2nd, we will decide whether we want to offer the job to someone, one of our six candidates, or whether we want to start the process all over again. So you will hear something from us on February 2nd. The scorecards that you have will also be made available to the public. So after this process is over, we're going to find a spot to collect them all. So if anybody wants to look at the score sheets, they can. So please remember that if you decide to put your name on your score sheet or not. After this one hour interview, we're gonna take a half an hour break. And then Mr. LaRoe will be set for a public forum, for the public forum discussion next door. During that half an hour break, we ask, that you not at, we ask that you not present any questions to the candidate because we as a group want to be able to hear all the questions and all the answers. So we are asking for your indulgence and respect in that. Alex Barker, the president of ASG, will be asking all the questions this morning. And so Alex, take it away. Thank you, Linda. Question one. Laramie County Community College is interested oh, in the I'm quality sorry. of their program. Give us an example of a time when you became aware of efficiency and program quality at a college, where you were employed, and how you fixed the problem. Thanks, Alex. Uh, before I answer that, I'm going to make a brief comment. Is that, is that all I would do? Oh, thank you very much. I, before we begin, I wanted to thank the committee for inviting me uh, to visit with you this morning. It's uh, very nice of you to uh, uh, give me that consideration. And I feel like I'm among friends. I'm also among uh, new friends here this morning as well. Uh, I must say that it's, uh, it's great to be home, and uh, I feel very special about being in this place because I get to teach classes in about this space and in this, uh, in this portion of the building. And I think I taught classes for Mr. Mosier. I taught Introduction to Business right in this uh, very confine, so it's, uh, it's great to be here. 
I wanted to tell you, Alex, and everyone on the committee, that my uh, my answers will be uh, will have a student focus. And if it's not clear, I will make it clear for you before, during, or after my response. I also will be speaking uh, primarily from uh, presidential experience. If you wish to have uh, uh, answers from my uh, time at uh, Dodge City Community College where I was an instructional dean, I'll be happy to do that, and or my time at Laramie County Community College as a faculty member. Um, time and again, you will hear me talk about a participative uh, decision-making process. Time and again, you will hear about uh, something uh, akin to the scientific method and I wanted to tell you that I have a vested interest in this college. Uh, the paper mentioned that I had done a stint uh, at uh, Laramie County Community College. Well, it was 20 years worth of stint. 17 years as a counselor and faculty member in the social science division. Uh, I, one year I was a, an assistant to the instruction as an assessment officer. One year was a division director for social science. And one year I was fortunate enough to have a, a sabbatical. I was the first person at LCCC ever to take a sabbatical. So uh, there you go. Uh, I've had many requests for help uh, to come help at the college. And finally I, I said, gee, after the, you know, the, the 22nd or third phone call, I said, yes, I put my paperwork in. And so here I am. I will utilize, I, I would like to utilize my leadership and presidential experience and skills that I have gained. And I want you to know that I have, in fact, been retired for two, two and a half years. Uh, but in that time, uh, I've used that in many ways. And so I'm now tanned, rested, and ready to uh, come back <laughs> to, uh, to, to uh, be an interim president. And now, Alex, I will uh, heed your, your question. My first, uh, the first question has to do with the quality of programs and give us an example when things kind of were uh, on the fritz and, and something needed help. And I'm going to speak at Northwest College, uh, and I'm going to speak at Northwest College in 2003 when I arrived. Uh, the uh, former uh, uh, Eltra, uh, excuse me, John McMinnis College is here, and I don't mean to apologize. Northwest College uh, trustee Jack Turnell, who is the owner and manager of the Pitchfork Branch, said to me when I arrived, he said, why, why are you here? The place is broken, run down. And it, it truly was uh, uh, in need of help. It had many challenges. You know, money and the lack thereof was, was kind of the answer. But it really became, it came to uh, visit me, it came right over, darkened my door, if you will, when I first arrived. And that had to do with <coughs> student housing. For some reason, there have been uh, some decisions made regarding student housing. And I consider student services, by the way, a program. So. I'm going to speak to that. For some reason, student housing was really unsuccessful at that point in time. The occupancy rate stunk. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to speak plainly and, and in a forthright manner. And if that bothers anyone, I'm sorry. But uh, we don't have much time to uh, fiddle around with that. But anyway, the things were not going well. And so student housing was a focus and a crisis at the time. And some decisions had been made to move the only co-ed uh, hall into the oldest, uh, perhaps most decrepit hall there was. And I, you know, I never gave it a thought because I didn't take the, uh, I didn't take the opportunity to walk across the street to visit the, the facility, and, and shame on me. But uh, it was tired, it was old, and it was dirty, and nobody really thought that, that was an issue until something happened. We had many people visiting the campus uh, that summer, specifically parents and students and they would all go take a look at Coulter Hall. And then mysteriously, all those students were attending college and, and turning in their applications to Montana State University in Billings, and they were at Sheridan College, and lo and behold, they weren't with us. They weren't with us in any shape or manner, and um, things were not good. So it was impacting not only the housing, it was impacting attendance, and we had to do something quick. So we employed, if you will, uh, a structured problem-solving process. We recognized our problem. We began discussions. We uh, gathered the people that were going to be impacted, heavily impacted by that decision, and we, we, we began the process. We knew that we had to take uh, some interim actions, and that's part of the process of which I would speak at times, and we can get things underway. So we employed that scientific method, 
And also in my back pocket, I put together some, you know, some general business principles that I thought would work uh, for, to solve this particular problem. We were looking at a co-ed only hall. It was Coulter Hall, and as I said, it was in poor shape. So we went in, we cleaned it, we refurbished it, we attended to safety issues that were not valued at the time, and I'll tell you what those were. Uh, we, the exterior lights were not working, well, maybe a few. So I said, gee, why is it so dark over here? And they said, we don't want to, we don't want to spend the money on light bulbs. I'm not making that up. I said, by golly, I'll bet we can. So we, you know, we, we attended to safety, and we did something that maybe Mr. Mosier would appreciate. I said, if we're going to approach our housing sort of in a Sears Roebuck manner, where, where remember the old, the old slogan was good, better, and best, I said, we had to make it good. So we made the hall good. We knew we couldn't be better. We knew it couldn't be best. But we lowered the prices significantly. Because I said it was better to have 100% occupancy and cash flow than it was to be at 40 or 30% and starving. So we, in fact, did do that. With the time and resources allowed, we solved that problem. Now, that didn't take care of housing. Um, across the campus. We didn't do anything in a fell swoop in that particular summer, but we did so for the co-eds uh, in moving into Coulter Hall. And it turned out to be a success. And we, we uh, engaged that success throughout the five years that I was president at Northwest College. So uh, he was probably saying, well, maybe you'd sat in your office and sort of said, it's a success. No. We looked at the occupancy rates. We took a look at our revenues. And uh, ultimately, we started comparing very well with the uh, four-year schools and other community colleges uh, that have residence halls. And I better stop there, because I think I'm allotted five minutes or so for question if I'm going to make the hour, Alex. So that's, a, that's what I'm going to, I'll stop right there and say thank you for that question. That was fun to talk about. Question two. Organizational executives often delegate broad authority to subordinates. Suppose you had authorized someone to fix a particular problem and this person kept reporting progress on getting the problem fixed, but you were unable to determine if the situation was actually improving. How would you go about assessing progress on the problem? If it turned out that there was no progress, what would you do then? Well, uh, thank you. you know, assessment and progress is, is always good to be um, uh, asking about and, and judging at any particular time. Colleges should and use. Uh, uh, established criteria for virtually their entire campus and their entire operations. You have a mission, you have a mission. You have values, you have strategic plans, you have annual plans, and proactive presidents should know the condition of the campus and where those problems lie. They should know. Uh, I try to at all times. Not always was I successful, but if we have a problem, what you would do once again, I believe, is engaged in a, a structured process to resolve the problem. You communicate and you work with the people involved. You recognize the problem, you investigate the problem, you analyze it, you discuss it to no end and, until you think you're ready for some action, you plan, you act, and you sometimes need to take interim actions, not unlike what I did with, with the housing example that I gave before. If it doesn't succeed, then you repeat the process. I actually believe that so that you can maintain some structure in, in what you're doing. If you leave that, you find yourself a little bit uh, 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 afoot, and that isn't necessarily the, the, the thing. I, I must say that one of the success factors that I've employed over the years is persistence. If you have the problem, if you have the structure by which you know how to solve the problems, persist. Now, some of you will probably say, well, gee whiz, what are the consequences? What are the rewards of all of this? Do you need to uh, have increased resources? Do you need to have new and improved personnel? Well, sure. You can plug any of those that you wish into it, any of them, whatever, the, whatever fits the, the situation. Oftentimes, this is very situational. You may find yourself needing more money, more time, different individuals, but that's how I have uh, enjoyed success with regards to problem solving. If, please don't look at something like this and say, gee, that sounds pretty trite. It actually is pretty true. It works. 
and uh, I've enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I probably was not the, the brightest science student in the world in high school, but I did pick up a few things. And uh, you know, the, the measures of, uh, of problem solving were one of them. I walked away with that, and it served me well for many years. Question three. Tell us about a time in your career when a whole department in your organization needed to be restructured. How did you handle that situation? Thanks, Alex. I'm going to uh, uh, move away from Northwest College now, and perhaps just a general uh, remark, and, and move to Eastern Idaho Technical College as the, uh, as the uh, source for this e example. I was the president of Idaho's smallest college, smallest independent college. It was a technical college in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And uh, it's just like a community college, except that it doesn't offer AAs and ASs. We just don't have an academic wing uh, so that we can offer those, those programs. And uh, I, I'm going to talk about a, a situation. And curiously, the solution has some LCCC roots. Obviously, working here it does, but it's not all about me in this particular, in this particular response. Uh, when I arrived in 1996, uh, the college had a very poor FTE enrollment. We served thousands, literally thousands of workforce training uh, non-credit students, but our, our credit enrollment was not good at all. It had dipped below 300 on an annual basis, and so we were hurting. And there were some political issues uh, at hand that I didn't care for. For instance, Idaho State University wanted to absorb us because they wanted our campus, they wanted our money, and they wanted our people. And I, I knew that where that left me. <laughs> it left me out in the cold, and we weren't going to let that happen. And our funding was based on our enrollment. Whether we liked it or not, the FTE enrollment drove future fund, uh, funding. And at that particular time, the college was still sort of mired in a a vocational school approach to academic instruction. They brought 12 kids in, they put them in a room, and they shut the door, and you started at eight and you let them out at four. It didn't look anything like Laramie County in the college. The students were not responding to it well, and we really needed to go someplace else with this. And lo and behold, we had a program. We had a nursing program on campus, and it was quite successful, but once again, we could only take in 12 students, and we usually graduated 10, and the, uh, we had 10 pass the registry, the, the nurses test, the LPN registry. And I thought, gee, this isn't great, but I didn't argue with it at the time because I was new. And then something happened. I started getting three phone calls a week from parents. You know, Maybe I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed at times, but after the third or sixth or the ninth phone call, I caught on. I'm saying, gee, something's up. So I trotted over to the student, you know, student services and I said, gee, we're getting a lot of phone calls from parents and students asking to be in the next you know, round of, of students in the class. I said, how many applicants do we have? And I said, 250. I said, really? 250? So I, I said, I know why I'm getting the phone calls now. So I, I recognized that there was a great need. And, and the mission and the vision of the college was to serve the community. And it was really apparent that we were not. So away we went. Uh, we started talking about this in various quarters of the college. The President's Advisory Council, the Instructional Resource Council. And we, we really were quite active with it. We talked to the nurses about it. And they basically said, gee, we need help. We need money and whatnot to solve all this. So, I know when I'm overmatched by a problem. Uh, I said to myself as a president, I'm not going to wade in deep here and be the savior of the nursing program. I need help. So I hired Luke Robbins, who is a former instructor here at uh, Laramie County Community College. And he became my dean of instruction, and I also hired Kathleen Nelson, who was uh, a nursing educator from Ricks College. That's BYUI now, but it was Ritz College then. And, and we brought both of those in and said, Julius, we've got something for you right out of the chute. I said, well, how can you help us out here? 
And they said, well, let's look at it. They're bright individuals, good individuals, hardworking people. They went away and came back and said, we have your answers and life will be good. And I said, really? Talk to me about it. They had developed a, I'll call it a ladder approach to the nursing program by which it was open entry. Anybody, anybody could be in the program, but you had to take it in steps. And if you successfully pass step one or ladder drum number one, you could go to two and three and four and five. And I was warned that this was not a good thing. I, I had administrators that said, you know what, this is going to cause a problem. You're going to double our FTE enrollment. I said, what a great problem. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm forever grateful to those individuals. But we, we had a goal. I got out of the way. We recognized, uh, reorganized the program. It became open entry. It became laddered. And success followed. And, and, and truly, there was happiness throughout the land. I no longer got the phone calls, for one thing. And we had uh, some real tangible results. Uh, the enrollments quickly jumped to 250. And suddenly, I was in good stead with the state of Idaho as a president in a college. We had graduates of about 40 to 45 a year. Um, they were passing the, uh, the registry at a 95 to 100 percent rate, and I thought it was good. Now, I want you to know that this was a legacy move. This was, this was big stuff because we, uh, we changed the program. We put more nurses into the system. We suddenly had more taxpayers than uh, we had in a long time, if you will, in the, in the community. The, the hospitals loved us. Ultimately, this program became an RN program. Ultimately, we were able to put enough money together to build a brand new nursing building. And uh, frankly, it saved, it saved our bacon. It saved the college. And so I'm happy to talk about that one at length. I'm very proud of that. Uh, if you're in Idaho Falls, please drive by the college and take a look at it. Uh, not only was it a, a great building, a great program, but uh, other institutions thought so as well and tried to uh, uh, sort of garner some of the success for themselves. But once again, it had an uh, uh flavor to it. By the way, Luke Robbins, for those of you that don't know, went on to, to be and is the president at the Louisiana Delta Community College in Monroe, Louisiana. I was just sick the day he walked in and said, I'm off to the, to the big time and, and, uh, and so on. Kathleen Nelson ultimately did the same thing. She became the nursing administrator at Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center, and she's one of my references. And I took more than my allotted time, but I've got to speed up here now. I'll do it on that. Question four. What is your idea of the proper relationship between a college president and a board of trustees? Uh, this is uh, critical to the success of a, of a college, and, and I understand the genesis of this particular question. Uh, the president, president and, the, and the, uh, the board should be like hand in glove, truly. Yeah, they, should, they should have a great professional relationship. It should be productive. It should be cooperative. It should be friendly. All should know that the president works for the board. And the board is there to establish policies, and ensure implementation, and so on. But there needs to be clarity of goals. There needs to be clarity of roles and clarity in proper conduct. They should have a common mission. And the common mission should be the success and the welfare of the students. And I'll stop there. Huh? Thank you. I, I had to pick up some time somewhere. And I'll, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Question five. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a time that you had to improve the image of the college where you worked. What actions did you take and what was the result? Well, I'm going to go back to Northwest College. And I'm going to give you an, uh, an example there. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the college was uh, sort of suffering some issues, um, the lack of money, um, and so on. And the, the campus facility was taking a beating. And uh, we, we needed to improve the, the image. Uh, it, was, it was run down. There was widespread neglect in the, the buildings. And, and our image was suffering, as I said, and it had a tangible and measurable impact in terms of the enrollment and so on. And there were a few other things. There were major complaints. There was little action. 
And, and to be honest with you, I, I think people have become accustomed to it. And uh, it, was a, it was a curious um, behavioral phenomenon. They thought everything was just fine. So change wasn't necessarily valued because there was a, there was a shortfall of money. It, it, was a, it was a tough job to get folks to say, gosh, there is an issue at hand. Uh, I, fresh eyes and fresh ideas <coughs> not, were not necessarily valued. And change was difficult. And uh, where we began was in a good, once again, structured, straightforward, <coughs> participative manner. We used the college annual or strategic planning process by which to get this established. So there was campus buy-in as to what we needed to do. And with that, it gave everyone license to sort of say, gosh, we need to, we need to get moving with all of this. Now there were some uh, so participation was involved in the decision making process. We talked about it until that would not happen, uh, and things got underway. There were some uh, emergencies, and I want you to know that when emergencies were at hand, a lot of things were off the board. When we had a boiler blow up or go out in the middle of the winter, the participative method was not at hand. The Dean of Administration and I got together and said, how are we going to get the building warm? Okay. So there was, there was discussion, but it was with a limited group of people. But we began, our, we identified our projects, we completed the projects as time and resources allowed. I want you to know that uh, students were involved, uh, once again, back to the, the residence halls. We, uh, our measures were student satisfaction, occupancy, the use of the buildings, um, and so on. Uh, we also recognized that we had to do some things that were political in nature. We had to change the Cody Center. The Cody Center was too small. It was in a steel building, steel-sided building, uh, out, on, um, out on the east end. We were forever getting complaints from the police about our students parking in the street. The theater was there, and they were arguing about who, got, who had the priority, so we made move to the Cody Center. So we changed our image there. We recognized it was widespread, and we needed Thing. So I'm very proud of the, of the campus, the way it looked in 2008, and I think it's been improved upon since with uh, the good efforts that we made during the both five years. But I want you to know that sometimes it came uh, at, um, it came dip it was a difficult in many ways. We not only looked at function, we looked at cosmetics and so on. And sometimes we had to employ unusual techniques. I can remember once the foundation wanted to have a big dance in the ballroom. And uh, we had an issue. The women's bathroom wasn't clean. We couldn't get it clean. We had a little issue with maintenance. And so I called my wife. And she went and cleaned the bathroom. And so I, I want you to know that sometimes these things are, you probably say, well, these things all fall into fashion as a nice organizational effort and whatnot. Everybody falls in and, and life goes on and, and life is good. Not so. My wife, by the way, wanted me to mention that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my patriotic chore. But, you know, we, sometimes you have to go above and beyond to get things done. Choose your method, choose your, choose your battle, but that's what happens. And, and Alex, I, I won't tell you about the we did have an image problem at uh, Northwest in that um, people wanted to change the mascot. The mascot is the trappers. And I cannot tell you how many times I had women in my office saying, that sexist image has got to go. Uh, I didn't know what to say. I said, uh, if it is, you start to change, and you work with me and come back. Well, they never did. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I, I, sometimes there's a behavior that you don't and I wanted to just throw in, in that was sort of humorous. And that is, one day I had the folks from, uh, from uh, public relations come in and said, did you know that we're going to change the school colors? I said, the heck you are. Well, this is news. I said, what's wrong with, you know, it was red and gray. Uh, and they said, it's not trendy enough. They said, we want to be blue and gold. And I said, gee, there are a lot of people doing gold. So, uh, I, I want you to know that from all quarters come many things. By the way, it's still, it's still red and gray. <laughs> I, I couldn't help but think of L triple C's old colors. 
Right? <laughs> Some of us are old enough to remember the old. Everybody remember the old colors? Green and orange. Green and orange. I don't know that we went through a participative method to, to change those colors, but we suddenly had blue and gold. Okay. I'll speed it up. Question six. Describe a time when you took personal accountability for a conflict, failure, or problem and initiated a solution with an individual. Well, I, I'm going to make a statement, and then I, I recognize that perhaps uh, you asking for specific examples is good, but I'm going to ask what you would like to hear as an example. Uh, this is the statement. As a president, I take the responsibility. I, in 13 years, took the responsibility for all college papers. You can, you can delegate authority. You cannot delegate responsibility because the buck winds up stopping at your door. So I took responsibility for many failures. Now, I, there are some that are burning uh, in my memory. Uh, you can choose the Walmart example, the Christmas party example, the funding formula example. <laughs> By the way, these are all Wyoming. I, you know, one is an Idaho thing. The rogue employee example, or the bus. Anybody want to just hop right in? I'll even take one. <laughs> well, the, well, the rogue employees uh, were, were, were this. As much as I preached the, the good word of, of participative management, open communication, and uh, that sort of thing, everybody thought that, that was great for the president. Not necessarily applicable to everybody on campus. Rules, policies, procedures. We don't need no stinking policies and procedures at our level. We sort of heard that. And, um, and th this is the story. One day, as I was driving um, uh, home, I noticed that two semi trucks had pulled up to one of the halls at Northwest College. I thought, what's going on there? And lo and behold, I saw all these people busily unloading furniture. And I thought, well, that's nice. So I thought, well, maybe I'd just saunter over and see what was up. Well, I was informed quickly that, by golly, we had bought new furniture. Really? You bought new furniture? Well, how much? Well, you know, there was, it was a significant amount. It went beyond policy and so on in terms of bids. And I said, but we didn't put this through the board. I mean, this is a bid issue. Oh, we didn't do that because we knew what we wanted. Oh, okay, well, fine. And so and then they're unloading all this furniture and, and so on. And, um, I thought, well, what am I going to do at this point? I'm certainly not going to run back and call the board and say, oh, the sky is falling. I said, well, unload the furniture and we'll discuss this later. So, in fact, they did. Well, that's not the end of the story. A couple of days pass. It's now the weekend. person stops by the office and they said, are you going to go to the garage sale? I said, the garage sale? What garage sale? They said, oh, well, there's going to be one in the school parking lot. I said, the heck you say? I thought, well, I'll go over and sort of see what's up. Well, they've taken all the new furniture and put it in. It looked good. I won't argue that. They've taken all the old furniture out and put it in the parking lot. I said, so you're going to sell the furniture? Yeah. I thought, well, that's good because we didn't want storage. Storage was bulging and so on. I said, well, let me know how much you think you're going to make from this, and be sure to show up on Monday with the check or the money or the cash or whatever, and give it to the business office. And they said, we're not going to give it to the business office. I said, really? Whose furniture is it? And they said, it's ours. I said, so it's the housing department. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you going to do with the money? And they said, well, we're going to use it for student activities. Really? So I said, on Tuesday, I had a little visit with the Dean of Students. And I said, number one, you violated, you know, X policies and laws. You bought this, fine, it's over and done with. What are we going to do? And I said, and then you sold the furniture and you took the absconded with the money and you used it for purposes that probably were noble but inappropriate. And what I found out, Kevin, was is that any a number of times in my presidencies, there were individuals who felt they could um, do as they darn well pleased. So what do you do with that individual? You visit them. 
about the realities of you know things like state laws and college policies and so on, what you can or cannot do. And we really didn't have that issue ever again. We never had another uh, garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> the other stories are just as juicy, but not in the interest of time. Thank you, Alex. Hopefully that happens. It's, it's real life. Let me just ask one further question. Is there ever a time when visits aren't enough to get results? Um, I'll, re I'll fall back on my uh, previous answer. You repeat and you persist. I go out and get I really, and, and I must admit, admit that I was sort of direct after the second visit. We did have some further visits with regards to situations such as that about housing and what we could do. Okay. Question seven. Tell us how you have successfully led subordinates through change in the past and the steps you took to ensure a successful outcome. Well, I'll use a, an example of where uh, two colleges needed to have a new vision and mission. Uh, Eastern Idaho Technical College was in a, uh, a situation where we needed to create one and so was Northwest College a few years ago. Uh, the, the statements have become dated. That was recognized long before I had gotten there. Uh, but for some reason, nobody had gotten around to doing anything about it. Some talk, little action. We uh, put it into our annual goal setting. Once again, we, we went back and, and structured this where we put it into our annual uh, goal setting. And uh, it became then a priority that had uh, purchase with virtually everybody on campus. And so we appreciated that. So. We went ahead uh, through this process of discussion and participation uh, and, and began. Uh, I delegated the, the, the effort to the Vice President of, uh, of Public Relations, Mark Kitchen, who some of you know uh, from your, your travels around the state. And by the way, Mark Kitchen is a proud graduate of Central High School in <laughs> Cheyenne. I had to throw that in too. But anyway, Mark took the uh, the lead on this, and he did a really nice job with it. He took the proper amount of time and uh, and worked with this, and it was kind of a nice a nice effort. It was very democratic in nature. It was fun. The decision was ultimately made, and it was a big deal. The, the key to this that I felt was is that I, I delegated this. Uh, Mark shepherded, uh, and he did a really fine job in, 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 in uh, interacting with the entire it, it worked out extremely well. It worked out extremely well. And uh, the, um, the vision and the mission that you see today is, is what we decided upon a number of years ago. So it, it worked out extremely well. Question eight. Describe one of the most difficult decisions that you have made in your role as a leader. What would you do differently next time and what did you learn? Thank you for that one. That, that one sort of puts, uh, that's a difficult question to ask, but one that uh, should be asked. The, the most difficult decisions I've ever made as a college president have had to do with personnel. Personnel. Whether they should be uh, hired, fired, uh, disciplined, or whatever. Uh, the decisions to be made involve action. The easy route involves sometimes non-action. Sometimes it involved decisions, and sometimes there were no decisions to be made, and, and oftentimes that wasn't the right way for the college. Okay, Alex, so I'm back now to allowing you uh, the opportunity to ask, this was fun to, to think about this. It's kind of like a trip down memory lane, uh, but uh, would you like to know about felonies? Would you like to know about dysfunctional behavior? Would you like to know about uh, termination of employees, corrupt behavior? Let me talk about felons. No, I'm kidding. What would you like, Carol? Dysfunctional behavior. Well, the dis <laughs> <laughs> um, Look at the look you get from Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the dysfunctional behavior probably falls back on what I just mentioned before, whereby uh, people really felt that it was just fine for the president to behave in a particular manner, but not necessarily for themselves. And people felt that the, um, 
the, uh, the college uh, existed for, to, for their own benefit. Uh, and, and, and took liberties that, that ultimately hurt students. I'll give you a really quick example. At Eastern Idaho Technical College, we had an auto program. As part of the program to make it look attractive to students, we allowed them to bring at one of their own cars in at times uh, and, and work on it. Uh, they were sort of later on in their program. But we had an instructor that uh, encouraged all this, and uh, students invariably brought in their cars. And uh, the, the cars would be brought in, and the, and the, uh, the um, instructor was taking advantage of this. He would approach the students, and he would say, gee whiz, where'd you get this car? And, he would, and the students would say, well, it was grandma's, and it doesn't work very well, and I'm going to put it together and drive it. And he said, I've got a better answer. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give you 300 bucks for it right today, and you can go out and buy a better car than that. So the students tumbled with regularity to the $300 offer. So the faculty member would park the car, and then mysteriously, the students were working on the car. Mysteriously, we were using college uh, resources to fix the car, and lo and behold, after a week or two, the car was functional, it went out, and the car was sold for $900, or 1000 Take your pick, there was money to be made. Once again, we have a, an issue with an individual who took liberties with students, which I felt was uh, not good. I took liberties with uh, laws and so on. And uh, ultimately, uh, this person had the opportunity to seek employment elsewhere. Because it was cl clearly stated in college policy that you won't do that sort of thing. It was clearly stated in state law that you would not do that. So here was some here were some individuals that were act, acting in a dysfunctional manner as far as I was concerned. And edu education took the hit, and the students took it really right on the lip. You know, the, the, it, was, uh, it, it became a silly. So that individual is now in Arizona. Anyway, I, I will tell you that the tough, tough things, uh, I had to ask people to go seek employment elsewhere. Uh, the, the tough ones were the felonies. We had an individual who, by the way, guys, this is an agricultural story. I've got an agricultural story. I saw the ag group <laughs> one, and I, I can't pass this up. We had a, we had the, the college at one point in time had been donated land to quote have an experimental farm or whatever, and they grew alfalfa out there. We had an individual that was on, on staff that thought that was a great idea, so they did, and they did. They raised the alfalfa out, out there by the cop. And mysteriously, school equipment uh, put the uh, hay up, and the hay was supposed to have gone to the horse program. Seems like a great idea, right? Well, the hay never reached the horse program. So the college had the land, we had the crop, we had the fuel, we had the equipment, and the instructor took advantage of all of this and took all of the hay to his sheep farm. 150 times. I, I got wind of this and said, you know, I don't think this is right. So uh, I took a quick look at the, the laws of the state of Wyoming code, and this constituted a felony. And although this was tough to ask a person to go away, I gave them the option. I, I tried to be as humane about this as possible. They could either tender their resignation because of the obvious and now public uh, acknowledgement of the, of the crime, or I could turn it over to the county attorney. They became self-employed by choice. That to me was a tough decision. You know what it's like to go in and say, you know what, you know, bad things have happened and we need to go a different direction. That was not fun. None of them were. And I unfortunately had to uh, deal with some of those uh, over the course of 13 years. Not said there. Uh, but, oh, I, I'm going to finish up here. I, I said that you have to act with resolve. It has to be planned. You have to be tactical about it, and so on and so on. Question nine. Okay. Tell us about an accomplishment you are most proud of personally and professionally. What made it so successful? Well, the, the uh, I've got, once again, an, I, Tex Boggs, who was the former president at, down at Western Wyoming College, told me one time, he, just before he retired, he said, Miles, you've been the luckiest president 
in the state of Wyoming. And I said, how's that? He said, you've had the opportunity to do so many things the presidents never get to do. And I said, not tax. Is that a compliment? What, what is that all about? He said, you've had that opportunity. Uh, there's been any number of times where we've been able to do good deeds, if you will, that are memorable uh, at, the, at the college level. Uh, once again, I have brought in a selection for you. Alex. And uh, I will say that the core of all of these has to do with students. And it has to do with success. Take your choice. Success first, students second, whatever. Before you go. So I have, I have five. I have the uh, Eastern Idaho Technical College Foundation, the Northwest College Foundation, the Corvette, <laughs> the, big, the big chief tablet story, or the Bridger Hall fire. The Northwest Foundation. You want to hear about the Northwest Carol Foundation? Carol looked at me, so. Oh, so. Well, I'll tell two stories. I'll tell two stories about the foundation. Uh, I have been very fortunate as a president to be associated with the sort of growth and development of two foundations. Northwest College Foundation is, is, is headed by uh, and directed by Shelby Wetzel, a very competent individual, wonderful individual, believes in Northwest College a great deal. And when we had the matching funds uh, become available a few years ago through the state of Wyoming, wonderful program, that, that foundation blossomed like nobody's business. Northwest College wasn't supposed to keep up with the big boys like L Triple C or Casper College, but we did. In many instances, we surpassed them, and uh, it, was, it was great. And so, the beneficiaries of that were the students. We suddenly had more money than we, than we ever imagined. I mean, we were lucky to shake out some change originally, and I think they're at eight hundred thousand to a million dollars a year that they contribute to scholarships and the, and the functioning of the college. I think it's great. Um, the uh, the uh, iTech story was uh, similar. That when I arrived at Eastern Idaho Technical College, I went to the foundation director and I said, gee, how are we doing? I thought I would get this nice printout, glossy brochures, goals, all the trappings that you would see with the college. She said, I don't know. She said, let me look. And she opened up the right-hand drawer of her desk and got out a checkbook, like you would carry in your pocket. She opened it up and said, we have $247,000. I said, that's it? I said, so our entire operations are being run out of, if you will, in sort of a passbook, almost, uh, approach? Well, we got over that. And I was very happy to say that, that I was part of what was called the Million Dollar Club at Eastern Idaho Technology. We finally uh, put together at least uh, a corpus of a million dollars. It's now past that. I'm very pleased. I have to give the credit to uh, Jan Karen. It was a success, and the students benefited. It was wonderful. I appreciate it. The, uh, I've got two more minutes, Alex. I'm not going to waste any time. Um, I still get a glow from a number of things. Some of them are small. Some of them are very large. But I got to tell the big chief tablet story. When I arrived at a certain college in Idaho, I summoned the the. Um, we didn't have a dean of administration when I arrived. We were just sort of a rambling com committee, and it didn't work. So I, I asked our college accountant to come in and tell me about the financial status of the college. And I said, "Bring in the printout." My late my oh, no. my oh, no. Carol, are you going to keep me honest? <laughs> As a former instructor, you see those, uh, those quick movements in class. Uh, um, so I asked the individual to come in and, and tell me about the status of the college. And he didn't, uh, I thought he would appear within the hour. Well, the hour sort of went its way. I thought maybe a day it went away. I finally got to Friday and I said, are you going to come see me and we'll, we'll have a nice chat? He said, I can make it Monday. I said, okay. Monday it is. So he came in, and I, he said, it's time to uh, give you that report. I am not making this up. The guy had in his left hand, and he's a nice man, a very capable individual, said, 
here's your report. He had a big cheap tablet. You know, the, the brown paper lines, got the chief on the front. He opens the cover very carefully. He turned around and it had 10 lines of figures on it. About that much. He said, here it is. I said, I don't even know what this is. Read it to me. And he did. And I said, well, that's nice. Well, within 90 days, we were able to have printouts whereby we could read all the department's uh, status, where we were going. Now, there's a legacy to this. Um, because the college administration and those involved could see where they were with their funds and what we were doing with the funds, we were able to make more calculated decisions than ever before and ultimately help the students. And you probably say, well, give me one example. The one example, I better keep this because I need to know where I am. Um, the one example is that we put together uh, funds to start new programs. We started the surgical tech program and we used the funds to build that nursing building uh, of which I'm very proud. That's one. By the way, last but not least, back to why I'm story because I do have nine minutes left, uh, is the Bridger Hall fire. Uh, you may or may not know that in 2005, in March 2005, we had a devastating fire at Northwest College. It burned Bridger Hall down. There wasn't any gifts, hands, or butts about it. It burned. Um, it was an emergency, and we had uh, many things to do. It was a no-fault fire. It started because of a faulty uh, power strip. And by the way, here comes my plug for going to Ace Hardware or whatever. Please buy heavy-duty uh, extension cords and power strips with surge protectors. But it, it started in a student's room, and uh, it burned the hall down. Uh, the fire went from the, the cork board to the bed, up into the ceiling, and because the building had been built years and years ago, it did not have fire stops in the attic. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, boy, was it hot. And uh, we, we destroyed it. There were no injuries. I was very proud of that. There was not one injury. Um, there was one individual who was taking a shower, a male, who had to jump in the raw from the, the balcony into the bushes and uh, seek uh, clothing. I don't know where, but he did. Uh, he suffered some scratches and so on. Uh, we did have one, in, one fireman who had smoke inhalation, and we had two issues uh, with individuals with asthma on campus. Now, what made that Okay, so there you go. Fire had burned for three days, and I have to say thanks once again to the Powell, the Cody, the Lovell, <coughs> the Franny, the Deaver, and even Wapiti, Wyoming. Wapiti sent out uh, firefighters to help fight that fire. God bless them. Um, but anyway, what was so wonderful about that and gave me such a good glow was is that everybody during this emergency understood, understood the seriousness of it all. And the college family and the community pulled together for the students who were the residents of Bridger Hall. And all was well. We took care of the students in terms of housing and clothing and food, and uh, it, it worked out well there. Uh, once again, I know when I'm over my head, and some of these uh, things were uh, going on in a, in a quick fashion, I delegated. The, the major responsibility to Kim Mills, who was the, the Vice President of Administration at that time, did a wonderful job. And in all of this, we persisted. We persisted with all of this, persisted through the fire, the aftermath, and so on. And uh, we did have a brand new hall at Northwest College. I said we, Northwest College has a brand new hall. It's called the Ann and Alan <coughs> Simpson Hall, named after the former uh, U.S. <coughs> Senator. It's state of the art. But who was the beneficiary of this? Like the phoenix rising from the ashes, the students were the beneficiary. They loved the new hall, and it works great. It was far better than Bridger Hall ever thought of being. And so through the success came through good leadership, as far as I was concerned, persistence, good practices, and it ended well. And I'm very proud of that. Always will be. Did I miss one? No, I don't know. I didn't talk about the Corvette. Be sure to say some time for yourself to ask us some oh, questions at the end. Okay. The All right. I will. The number 10 is easy. Question 10. If an employee came to you with a problem relating to another employee and nothing had been taken care of previously, how would you handle the situation? Well, I thought that number 10 was a trick question, so uh, 
perhaps get uh, a quick answer. I, I looked at this time and again and related uh, back to um, my experience as a college president and you know, felt that uh, if this was a serious situation, uh, as it uh, is deemed to be in question 10, that the college uh, in this situation should follow procedure, and I'm sure that it is in your college procedures, and you would uh, go about the problem solving in that particular manner, as prescribed by the college policy and procedures. There you go. I told you I could do it. <laughs> I guess. Are there any questions you would like to ask? Yeah, I, and I'm sure that I'm sure that we, uh, since you've been at this uh, for through uh, five of us now, perhaps you could just give me the top three college challenges that are probably um, going to be asked of the inter interim president. The top three. I've given you the top five on things, but just the top three. Yeah, it, it may turn into four miles, okay. but. Um, in, in the interim president, we are, we are looking for, first of all, to bring a sense of healing to the college. The, the college has been under some stress over the last few months, and, and there's a, a, a need for some, some healing and, and nurturing of the college itself. We are also looking at some stability, someone who can be a real stabilizing force for the college. Uh, there's, through some of the stress and turmoil over the last few months, there are there's a lot of uncertainty, so we, we also need some stability. And then there are a couple of projects going on right now that we're going to need some leadership through. One is we're going through a, a man, a, a audit, a, what's the word? Thank you, organizational. An organizational audit. Uh, as to different positions on campus and the and the structure of, of personnel and and um, leadership on campus, and then uh, we are also going through a master plan review, and we have started both of those processes, the master plan review and the organizational audit, and so we would also expect the the interim president to lead us through those two projects that that have already begun. Uh, in all of that, and, and reading the papers and whatnot, I'll, I'll follow that up in, in the interest of time really quickly. How's the financial condition of the college? Um, stable is what I would say. He healthy and stable. I would say sound. Sound. Sound is a good word. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what is the timeline of the interim? at this point in time, is it four months, five months, a year? Um, we've had a lot of discussion about that, Miles, and, and I can't answer your question specifically. After we have an interim president in place, then we're going to start a search for our permanent president. And we are aware of the fact that we're late in the process. Doing this in the spring, makes us a bit late because a lot of presidents already have a job starting for in the fall. So we know there's a, a bit of a, a timing problem in trying to find somebody fast enough to start in the fall. We are also extremely committed, every board member is committed to taking the time to find the right person. And so we don't want to rush through the process. What we have discussed among us is anywhere from six months to a year and a half, depending. Depending, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any uh, uh, expectations in the interim that, um, that have perhaps not being, been made public? Um, is, is this the right form to, to ask that? Uh, Things that I haven't seen in the paper or things that have developed even in the last couple of days. Can you see? I'm looking at my fellow board members because I, I can't think of anything. Yeah. So I'm looking at all of them to see if they can think of anything. Well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll chat perhaps about uh, any of all those in the next forum. But um, I'll just say thanks again for the hour. I, I know that perhaps I should tempered some of my remarks during the time, but I felt that you should know me. <laughs> and we, we need to get to know you, Miles. That's the, that's the point. And I thank you.
Thank you. And I was incorrect about the half an hour break. We are now taking an hour lunch break. So uh, please take an hour for lunch. And uh, Miles will, will be present for his public forum next door at 1 o'clock.